Okay, um, on graphs and functions, this is sections, the first few sections in the uh, book by Blitzer. And we'll talk about plotting points and equations, how to find intercepts, functions, domains, and ranges, interval notation describing graph, functional notation using graph to solve equations, and even and odd symmetry. And at the very end, there's a list of sort of highlights of this lecture. So plotting points and equations, how to find intercepts. So a point is just two numbers, an x coordinate, which is two, and a y coordinate, which is one. So if we want to plot this point, we go to x equals two, we go to y equals one on the y-axis, and we look for the point that's got x coordinate two and y coordinate one, and that's the point two comma one. That's an ordered pair. So if we have a formula like this, y equals absolute value of x minus one, we can if we're given the x-coordinates, we can figure out the y-coordinates and then we can plot it. So absolute value of x means just takes the x value without the sign. So absolute value of minus three is three, three minus one is two, absolute value of minus two is two, two minus one is one, minus one has absolute value one, one minus one is zero, zero minus one is one, absolute value of one is just one, oops, minus one, and then zero again, and then one and two. And so now we can plot these points. If we go to x equals minus three, want a y value of two. So that's this point, minus three comma two. And then minus two comma one is there. Zero comma minus one is here. Oh, no, that's minus one comma zero about that. This is 0, comma minus 1. X coordinate first, Y coordinate second. So 1, 0 is this point. And then 2, 1 is here. And then finally 3, 2. And we can sketch the graph because now we've plotted these points. We know absolute value of X sort of looks like a V. So absolute value of X minus 1 is a graph that looks like that. And it goes off so there's how you can graph a point by graphing some, graph a function by graphing some points. So the x-intercepts of a graph are all the points on the graph with y-coordinate equal to zero. The y-intercepts of a graph are all the points on the x, on the graph with x-coordinate equal to zero. So this and this are the x-intercepts because it's where the graph goes through the X axis, X intercepts. Here is the Y intercept. Because it's where the graph goes through the Y axis. And you can pick these out, right? X intercepts, they have Y equal to zero. So you can pick them out on the table because they're the place where you get a zero in the y coordinate. The y intercept has x coordinate equal to zero, right? Because that's the y coordinate. And so this point where the x coordinate is equal to zero, that's the y intercept. And so you can look at that from the table. So right from the graph, you can just, you know, eyeball it. So is the point 5, 5 on the graph? This is an interesting question. What does it mean to be on a graph? Well, the way we construct this is we pick, pick the x and we plug in, find the corresponding y. So what does it mean to be on a graph? So what does that mean? You plug in the values and if the equation is true, then the point is on the graph. So it's five, five on the graph. The point we're dealing with is x equals 
five, y equals five. The equation we're dealing with is y equals absolute value of x minus one. If we plug in, we get five, and we want to know, is that equal to absolute value of five minus one? So we plugged in y equals five here. We plugged in x equals five there. And we said, okay, well, is that equation true? But absolute value of five minus one is four, so this is not true. 0.55 is not on the graph. So you can test if a point is on the graph by just plugging it in and seeing if it works. If it works, it's on the graph. If it doesn't, it's not. So here's a graph. It's actually a circle. Where are the x-intercepts and where are the y-intercepts? Well, you can look at this and say, well, we know one x-intercept is here. One x-intercept is there. It looks like the x-intercepts should be um, the point minus one zero and the point three comma zero. To check, plug them into the equation and see if they work, right? So if we plug in x equals minus one, y equals zero into equation, what do we get? We get minus one minus one quantity squared plus zero squared equals four with a little question mark because we don't know if it's actually true or not yet. So this is minus two squared plus zero squared, that's just zero equals four with a little question mark. And we know that minus two squared minus minus is a plus four does in fact equal four. So we put a check there and we do know that that is in fact on the curve and it's an x-intercept because it's a point on the curve with y value zero. Y-intercepts, you can look at it from the graph. There should be one here. There should be one here. How do we find this? You set x equal to zero and you solve for y, right? Because whatever point this is, it's x is zero because it's on the y-axis and y is some number. Same like this, this is x equals zero and y equals some number. So the y-intercepts is where x equals zero. So we can plug that in. You get zero minus one quantity squared plus y squared equals four. Minus one squared is one plus y squared equals four. And that gives me the equation y squared equals three. And what are the numbers of that? There have to be two, right? Because we've got two um, intercepts. So if we take the square root of both sides, you get y equals plus or minus square root of three. And remember that you always get a plus or minus when you take the square root. So this is the plus square root of three, and this is the minus square root of three. And those are the exact values. So we'll say exact values, and that generally means leave the square roots, leave it unsimplified. Zero square root of three and zero minus square root of three, those are y intercepts approximately 0, 1.73. 1 1.73 is about the square root of 3, 0, minus 1.73. So that's how you can find the x-intercepts and the y-intercepts. Um, here you could just find the x-intercepts by looking at it, but you have to solve <clears throat> to find the y-intercepts. So functions, domains, and ranges. Functions will be very important in this class. And functions have three parts, a domain and a range and a way or a rule to get from the domain to the range so that, and this is the important part, each thing in the domain is associated to exactly one thing in the range. So we present functions of three ways, tables, graphs, and equations. We'll see they, how they interact. Which of these is a function? Well. If we're thinking about how functions work, how do graphs provide a rule to get from the x-axis, which is our domain, to the y-axis is the range, we have a graph. We want to start with some x value. We go up to the graph, and then we go over and we find the corresponding y value. Right? That's how we read graphs. So every x, you should be able to go up or down to the graph and then read off a y. Right? So for this one, right, if I take a particular x value, like x equals 0.1, I can go down to the graph, 
I see its y value and it's whatever this is, right? And likewise, if I take x to be this number, I can go up to the graph, I can read down for y value, and that gives me my y, y value. So x goes to y, x goes to y. So it's a rule to take everything from the x-axis to the y-axis. Now, the problem with this one on the right, if I take x equal to minus 2, I can go up to the graph and over, or I could go up to the graph and over here, or I could go down to the graph and over here. And the problem here is one x value has three y values. We don't like that. Each x value should have exactly one thing in the range. So this one is not a function because I can take this and say, well, if I take x equals minus 2, it cuts the graph in three places. So not a function. Here, no matter what x I pick, right? if I take x equal to any number, those vertical lines go through the graph in only one place. And so each x gets exactly one y value. So that's a function. So you may know this is the vertical line test. Right. And that's all because how do you deal with functions, graphs of functions, start with the x and the x value, you go up or down along the vertical line to the graph, and then you can read off your y value. If that vertical line hits the graph in more than one place, not a function. What about these? Well, if you have equations and you want to see if they're functions of x, you can solve for y. This one is that. So each x, it's only one y. If you think of your x as the input, if you pick an x value, you square it, you multiply 3, you subtract it from 5, and that gives you a number. There's no options about the number. This is a little trickier, though, because if you solve this for y, you get y squared equals the x squared comes over with a minus sign, minus 9 comes over as a plus. And then you have to take the square root. And that gives me two values for y. Here, each x gives me two y values. And that's the same sort of thing that happened in the circle. Right? If I take x equal to 0, there's a y value down here, and there's a y value up there. So there's actually two different y values for one x value, so that's not a function. And we like functions because functions are ways to say that if I have a given input, I know specifically what the output is. And so that determ that's a kind of relationship that you see a lot of, especially in things like business, um, where if you know what your costs are, you want to know what your profits are, that sort of thing. So equations, um, you take a number as your input, that's your domain, you run it through the equation, and you get out one number, and that's the range. So... For functions, in general, we want to know two things. What can you put in for x? What are the numbers that work for x? That's the domain. What do you get out for y? That's the range. That's the numbers that are outputs. So usually think of this as inputs, outputs. So graphs, the domain is on the x-axis. Range is on the vertical axis. So if we look at this, is this a graph of function? It is a function because it passes the vertical line test. Domain, well, a little round circle means we're not including that point. So my domain starts at minus 6. And we Every x gets a y all the way up to 9. Include that 9 because 
you plug in x equals 9, you get y equals to th minus 3. Range. So my domain is from here to here on my x-axis. The range, well, the bottom of the graph is at minus 3, including that. The top of the graph doesn't, it's really close to 3, but it doesn't exactly get there. It's supposed to be a parentheses. And so this is my domain. I mean, this is my range, which is vertical. And it starts at minus 3. That's down here. It goes up to 3, but doesn't quite get there because that's an open circle. So the domain is how far the graph goes left and right. The range is how far the graph goes up and down. OK, so we want to be able to describe graphs. Um, and we usually, we often use integral notation, which hopefully you have seen before somewhere. Um, but this is a short summary of this. Brackets mean include the endpoint. Parentheses mean do not include the endpoint. So if I say bracket minus 3 comma 7 parentheses, that's the same thing as saying minus 3 is less than or equal to x. So less than or equal goes with the square bracket. Oh, that didn't work. Um, and strictly less than seven, and that's the parentheses in that one. An open interval is one that does not contain the endpoints. So anything where both sides are parentheses like that. Or three is strictly less than x, strictly less than seven. Parentheses for infinity always, so infinity 154 to infinity, you don't include infinity because infinity is not actually a number. Um, so this just means all numbers bigger than 154, including 154. If you have just a single point, you can put it in braces. That's things like this. So x equals 5, this is 5. You can use a union symbol, which is a u. So either minus 2 less than x less than equal to 7, or x equals 10. You can write it like that. Um, on graphs, a point not included is an open circle. A point that is included is a filled-in circle, and we saw that here. This point is not included because it's open. This point is included. And then finally, sometimes 2 comma 3 is an ordered pair, a point with x-coordinate 2 and y-coordinate 3. Sometimes it means interval 2 to 3, um, so you have to be careful about that. Just pay attention to point and interval. So... <clears throat> um, Generally, we describe features of the graph of a function by looking at the intervals for which a property holds. So domain and range of this graph, right? So it's the same graph we said was from minus 6 to 9. So in interval notation, the domain does not include minus 6, but it does include 9. The range starts at minus 3 and includes minus 3, but does not include positive 3. So there's the domain of the range. So increasing and decreasing, this is thinking about graphs as you go from left, left to right. Um, so increasing means it's going up. Decreasing means it's going down. Right? Those are the definitions. And we only use open intervals because it doesn't, it's not entirely clear what happens at the point B. Is the function increasing there or decreasing there? We don't know exactly what that is. So intervals of increase and decrease. <clears throat> Where is this function increasing? Well, from B to C. And we describe that by going to the X intervals that correspond from, to going from B to C. So it increases for x is going from minus 3 to 1. And again, we can describe that in interval notation like that. Decreasing, it decreases for x going from minus 6 to minus 3. So all the way down here, x is going to minus 6 to minus 3. It's decreasing, so we'll write that like that. It's also decreasing from d down to e. And that corresponds to x values 4 to 9. And if we have two different intervals, we'll just join them together with the union sign. So minus 6 to 3, it's decreasing. And 4 to 9, it's decreasing. And then it's constant. That's where it's just flat. It's not going up. It's not going down. Um, and that's from x from 1 to 3. So 
increasing and decreasing constant. Relative max. Well, relative max is something that's higher than any nearby point. So most of these are not relative maxes. This is not a maximum because there's points nearby that are above it. These aren't maximums either because there's, if you pick one of these points, say at two, there's it's not higher than any nearby point. It's at the same level. So A looks like it could be, but A is not on the graph. This graph has no relative maximums. Relative minimum means that you are lower than any nearby point. B is a relative min. E is a little tricky. Some books say that it's a relative minimum because it's the lowest point on the graph. Um, some books don't because there's not points on both sides of it. Um, in our book, E is not a relative min. E, E, not relative min because it's an endpoint. Weirdly enough, it is a global minimum because it is because the global minimum is the lowest point that's on the graph. So this is the lowest point on the graph. So that's actually the global minimum, but it's not a relative minimum according to our book because there aren't points on either side of it. <clears throat> okay, finally, in describing graphs, we want to talk about increasing and decreasing the relative maximums and minimums. And we also want to talk about positive and negative. So positive So that's talking about the y values that you got out. So it's positive when graph is above the x-axis. And again, we describe that in terms of which x intervals we're looking at. So positivity from minus 6 to about there, which is about, we'll call that minus 4.25. This part of the graph is above the x-axis. From minus 1 all the way to 6, it's above the x-axis. So this will be minus 6 to minus 4.25 union, what was that now? From minus 1 all the way to 6. And remember, we look at these things in terms of intervals on the x-axis. f of x is negative when the graph is below the x-axis. And again, we're only looking at open intervals here. So from minus four to minus one. So as X goes from minus four to minus one. Oh, sorry, minus 4.25. Uh, let me undo that. Minus 4.25 to one, and this should be to minus one. From minus 4.25 to minus one, for all these x's, the graph is below the x-axis. And from 6 to 9, for all those x's, the graph is below the x-axis. So generally in dealing with this, we just deal with open intervals um, and not closed intervals. Um, we should technically include the point E here, though. Do that by putting this because our domain is restricted. And notice that 4.2 minus 4.25 and an x equals minus 1 and then x equals 6 
the y value is actually zero. It's neither positive nor negative. Okay, so functional notation, solving equations using graph. So generally we use x and y as variables. X is the domain variable, any number of the domain <clears throat> you can plug in for x. The result of the calculation when you do the calculation is the corresponding y value. If we want to emphasize the domain variable when we're talking about it, we'll write it like this, f of x. The f just stands for function. You can use any letter you want. Um, f of x, this kind of functional notation turns out to be really useful. Um, it means, right, f of x means function of a number in the domain. I can plug in any number in the domain in there and actually plug in other symbols as well. So, um, <clears throat> There's our function, what's f of two? Well, I replaced x with two on the left-hand side of this equation. So what does that mean to do? Whatever I do to one side of the equation, I have to do to the other side of the equation. So I have to replace all the x's in the right-hand side also with twos. Give me two plus two squared times two times two minus one. So I replaced all these x's with twos. Then you calculated that two plus two is four, four squared is 16 times two times one, because two minus one is one, and that's 32. So whatever I replace this x with, I have to replace all these other x's with the same thing. So f of minus 2, right? if I want that, I have to replace all these x's with minus 2's as well. And you get minus 2 plus 2 squared times minus 2 times minus 2 minus 1. And this is 0 because that's zero and zero squared is zero and anything times zero is zero. So everything just sort of drops. So note, incidentally, this is saying that y equals zero. So minus two zero must be an x-intercept of this function, right? If you graphed it, you would see that. Uh, what's f of h? So if we're going to replace this x with an h on the left-hand side, I have to replace all these other x's with h. h is another variable that we often use. That's another name, letter that we often use for variables. Um, and you just get that. Nothing really happens. You can multiply it out if you want. I wouldn't bother. What about f of x minus 2? Well, same deal. I'm replacing this x by the quantity x minus two. I want to be careful about this though, because this is not just a simple quantity like two or minus two or h. I'm going to make sure that I don't screw anything up by putting it inside of a parentheses. So I'm going to replace this x with the entire quantity x minus two, and I'll put that in parentheses. And then another x minus two, and then another x minus two, quantity minus one. And so I've replaced all three of these x's with x minus 2's. So what is f of x minus 2? Well, when we think about order of operations in parentheses, there's nothing that can be done inside the parentheses. And this is not a multiplication. It's an addition. So I can just get rid of the parentheses. And I have that. X minus 2 plus 2, well, the minus 2 plus 2 is 0, so this just becomes an x squared. This remains as an x minus 2. Minus 2 minus 1 is minus 3, so I can write that as x minus 3. So functional notation is useful because you can replace the x in the equation with all sorts of other things. You just have to remember that wherever there's an x, you have to replace it by the same thing. So here's this graph again. So what are the x-intercepts? What are the y-intercepts? X-intercepts here, here, and here. So my x-intercepts, and the x-intercepts are points. So I want to include both coordinates. Now, 
the y-intercept is here. There we go. What's f of minus 3? So this is sort of if we're given a graph, we have that f of minus 3 equals what? So this is saying that x is minus 3. What's the y value? Well, we know how to read functions, right? You go to x equals minus 3. That's here on the x value. You go down to the graph, and then you go over to read off what the y value is. What about f of 5? f of 5, we go to 5. That's x equals 5. We go up to the graph, and we go over to read out the y value. f of 5 equals 1. So f of x equals 1. So what's going on there? Here, we're saying that y is equal to 1. What is x? There's multiple possibilities. We take y equal to 1, that's here on the y-axis. So we know one possibility is 0. One possibility is x equals 5. And then another possibility is x equals minus 4.8. So to get all those possibilities, we look at the horizontal line y equals 1. We find all the places where it cuts the graph. So x could be minus 4.8, or x equals 0, because that's this point, or x equals 5. So three points for that. Um, what about f of x equals 2? How do we find all x values that have a corresponding y value of 2? Well, we go to 2 on the y-axis. We draw in a horizontal line like this. We see that this point, which is minus 5.2, that gives me a y value of 2. And anything from 1 to 4, these all have y coordinates 2. So if I want to get a 2 as a y value, my x values have to be either, and I'm going to put this in interval notation, 5.2, or it's the union symbol, somewhere between 1 and 4. And I'm including the endpoints because we have a square bracket. And finally, f of x equals 4. What is x? Well, we go up to y equals 4. That's up here. Put in a horizontal line and look for where this horizontal line cuts the graph, but it doesn't cut the graph anywhere. So there's no such x. OK, so if you know the y value, you can get the possible x values by looking left and right. There might be more than one. You have to be careful about that. And finally, we have even and odd symmetry. If we look at this graph here on the left, this has got a symmetry of even. That's because it's symmetric about the y-axis. If I pick a point on the graph, like 2.5 comma 5. That's this point. Then the corresponding graph with the point with the opposite x value, but the same y value is also on the graph. So I pick a point here, opposite x value with same y values on the graph. Okay, so for this one, this one's called odd. That means if I pick a point like this, which is the point 1, 2, 2, comma 2, and I draw a line through that point in the origin and just extend it out to the left, it'll cross the graph at the opposite point across the origin, so minus 2 comma minus 2. So for an odd graph, if I take a point that's on the graph and I flip the signs on both of them, then I get another point on the graph. Likewise, this point is x equals 1, y equals minus 2. 
go back up through the origin, we find that the point minus one, two is also on the graph. So let's flip the signs on those two. This just flips the sign on X. So symmetric about the y-axis is an even function, and symmetric about the origin is an odd function. And it's neither if it's neither even nor odd. So another way to think about even graph, if a pair xy is on the graph, so is the pair with the opposite x value but the same y value. If a pair x and y are on the graph, so is the point um, with opposite x values and y values. So are these functions even or odd? Well, we can look at a table and try and see that. Um, f of minus 3. What's f of minus 3? Let's go down there. Okay, to calculate f of minus 3, you would take minus 3 squared plus 1, right? Because I'm plugging in x equals minus 3 into both of those. Minus 3 squared, when you square a negative number, then minus sign goes away. So we get left with square root of 10 because square root of 3, because uh, 3 squared is 9 plus 1 is 10. So square root of 10. What about if you plug in x equals minus 2 into this, where you get 4 plus 1 inside the square root, so square root of 5. Um, minus 1 squared is 1 plus 1, so square root of 2. 0 squared is 0 plus 1. Square root of 1 is just 1. 1 squared um, is 1, plus 1 is 2, so we get a square root of 2. And this is a square root of 5, and this is a square root of 10, as you can pretty easily check. So notice that equal and opposite x's have the same y values. Minus 1 and 1 both have y value, square root of 2. That suggests that this is even, but we don't know because you'd have to check all the possible numbers. What about g of x, even or odd? Well, what's g of minus 3? It's going to be minus 3 cubed minus minus 3. So when we cube something, right, that's a number times itself three times. Minus minus 3 means a plus 3. So if I multiply minus three minuses together, I get a minus sign. So it's minus 27 plus 3 minus 24. Likewise, x cubed minus x when x is minus 2 would give me minus 8 minus minus 2, which is minus 8 plus 2 minus 6. Minus 1 cubed minus minus 1, that's going to be minus 1 plus 1. That would give me 0. 0 cubed minus 0 is 0. 1 cubed minus 1 is 0. 8 cubed minus that is 6. And then 3 cubed is 27 minus 3 is 24. And here, equal and opposite x values are giving me equal and opposite y values. These are all suggesting that it's odd. And if you get equal and opposite x values, if you equal and opposite y values, that's probably it. What about h of x? Well, it's the absolute value of x minus 1, so that's not too hard. Minus 3 minus 1 is minus 4. The absolute value of that is 4. This will be 3. This will be 2. This will be 1. This will be 0. This will be 1. Mark. This will be two. So here, equal and opposite x values, so one and minus one, give me completely unrelated numbers. So this one's neither. And we know it's neither because this is an example that's step four, that's there. This is an example that um, shows that it can't be even and it can't be odd. This looks like it's even, but we only tested seven numbers. This looks like it's odd. We only tested seven numbers, though, so we have to be a little bit careful. So how can you actually test this? Even means if you put in the negative number into the function, you should get the same thing as the function itself. So that's a semicolon. f of x equals x squared plus 1 square root. What is f of minus x? That's minus x quantity squared plus 1 inside of square root. But minus x quantity squared, the minus signs go away. That's just x squared plus 1. And this is the same thing we get when we just look at the function itself, right? Same formula. 
So this is saying that if I put in equal and opposite numbers, minus x and x, into the function, I get the same thing out. So odd functions means that if I put in the opposite x value, I should get the opposite y value. Remember that this f of x is the y value that you create, get when you calculate f of x. So our function was this. What's g of minus x? g of minus x is minus x quantity cubed minus minus x. A negative number cubed means you keep the minus sign and then you cube the number. Minus minus is plus x. So is this the same as this? Well, not exactly. They differ because it's a minus sign. But I can factor out the minus sign and I get this. That's minus g of x. So if I take equal and opposite x values and I plug them into the function, I'll get opposite, one's a plus, and one's a minus, g of x. So I change the sign on y. And neither the last one, this means that neither of those hold. If h of x is absolute value of x minus 1, you can calculate h of minus x, and you get minus x minus 1. And there's no real way you can simplify this to get that. You can do a little bit by factoring out that. But a minus sign doesn't really matter when you're taking absolute value. In fact, absolute value just gets rid of that. So it's absolute value of x plus 1. These are not related. So this one's neither. So right from the table, this one looks like it should be even. This one looks like it should be odd. You can check that by doing your calculations, these calculations. A program that is very useful that um, we'll use, I encourage people to use a lot is um, GeoGebra. If you've seen that before, it's a free online calculator. So here's GeoGebra. Um, and you can actually ask it to plot some of the functions. Y equals, and you can ask it for the keyboard, and the keyboard will tell you, oh, here's my square root. And I want x squared plus, oops, be careful you don't get trapped, plus 1. So there's the graph of x squared plus 1. That's one of our three functions. And if you look at that, that's a nice even function. It's symmetric over the um, x-axis. Our function x cubed minus x was another one. That's in blue. Right? And that's an odd function because it's symmetric over the origin. Right? And we saw that when we did our calculations. And finally, the last function was y equals absolute value of x minus 1. And that's the red function. The red function is neither odd nor even. You can make the other two go away by clicking on that. So this is not symmetric about the y-axis. If I take uh, x equals to 2, I get 1. But x equals minus 2 gives me 3, so it's not even. And if I take x equals 2, I get 1. But if I take x equals minus 2, I don't get minus 1, so definitely not odd either. So that's neither even nor odd. If this one is odd. Zoom in a little bit. Right, if we take 0.5, we can go down here. We see that we get this minus sign. If we take minus 0.5, we get the opposite one value. So um, two notes. So GeoGebra is very useful. And you know, if you look at the graphs, you can tell whether things are even or odd or neither. Finally, at the end of the lecture notes, there's just sort of a summary of what we talked about. So that's uh, graphs and functions. If I get this to end.